Welcome back to part two of our introduction to ecology. In this section we'll detail more on the aquatic biome, some more detail. We'll talk about lake death or eutrophication of lakes. We'll also discuss lake turnover and ecological succession. So let's look at some of the more detail on the aquatic biomes, uh, starting with the freshwater biomes. When we look at a lake uh, from up above, let's move this out of the way, uh, this is looking down on a lake from above. We, this is the border of the lake. Uh, all around the edge of the lake is what's called the littoral zone, or the lake edge. And this is where most of the life uh, inhabits the lake. There's plants that grow along the edge of the lake, and therefore that's where you're going to be most of your plant life, and therefore um, your uh, animal life also. And then out in the open water, uh, in the middle of the lake, would be your limnic zone, your zone of open water. You'd have a less uh, life, less living organisms. If we look at this same lake from a side view, uh, and this is the top of the water, it's a great drawing, I know, I know you're impressed with my artistic ability, um, we have what's called the photic zone, or the zone of photosynthetic activity, uh, and it reaches a certain depth. And then below that we have the profundal zone, the deep water zone, where we have no plants. And the question is why? Well, how deep can that light uh, actually penetrate? So the light's coming down, hitting the water, and it's diffracting in different directions. And uh, once you get to a certain depth, you just don't have enough light to, um, to run photosynthesis. Here are two more diagrams kind of showing the different zones of a, of a lake here. The littoral zones, these uh, the lake borders, the edges. Uh, up in this picture, we would see the, that same zone kind of from here in uh, where we have the vegetation on the edge and uh, lots of uh, uh, small invertebrates and other uh, organisms living around the edges of the lake. And then the open water limnic zone. Uh, and then from a, a depth standpoint, as we're going down, uh, we see that... Uh, we have the photic zone that light penetrates and the aphotic zone where we don't get enough light uh, for plant growth and the profundal zone, the, the deep water zone um, and the water surface of course and often in lakes we'll have a, a temperature stratification where as we go deeper uh, the temperature of course drops uh, the next thing I want to look at is how we can uh, classify lakes as either being oligotrophic or eutrophic uh, an oligotropic lake is a deep lake. Um, often it's nutrient poor, and therefore you have very clear water. Um, you have an unproductive phytoplankton. In other words, it's not growing and, and reproducing in great quantities. Uh, in contrast, a eutrophic lake is often shallow, nutrient rich, and the richness of the nutrients actually makes the water murkier. And we have a very pro uh, productive phytoplankton, uh, phytoplankton that's producing and reproducing in great amounts. And it's the eutrophic lake that I want to spend more time on. So let's look here. Uh, again, a eutrophic lake is shallow and murky. You have lots of plants that are along the shoreline. And as those plants go through their normal life cycle and die, uh, they fall into the lake. And this sediment build up, this uh, decaying matter uh, builds up over time. And the lake that used to be very deep slowly becomes more and more shallow. Now this is a natural process for lakes. Uh, it's not terribly uncommon, but it usually takes many, many, many years, you know, on the order of uh, thousands of years possibly for a small lake to, uh, to basically fill up and, and go away and, and die through what's called lake death. Um, here is a, a picture that kind of compares and contrasts a oligotrophic lake, low nutrient levels, good light penetration, lots of oxygen, uh, deep waters, low algae growth, and, and these types of different types of fish uh, compared to a eutrophic, a shallow lake uh, with low dissolved oxygen, high algae growth, uh, and high nutrient levels, and poor light penetration. So very different types of lakes. Um, this picture, let me bring this to the front, uh, this picture uh, shows a picture of a very much uh, eutrophic lake, lots of vegetative matter growing in it. Uh, this lake is probably getting more and more shallow by the year as the vegetation falls in and fills up the lake from the bottom. And eventually this lake could, could die, could suffer from lake death or lake eutrophication. But what's interesting is we look at the process, and I'll bring this to the front now, of eutrophication. Like I said, it's a normal process. Uh, we have algae in the lakes. We have plant matter in the lakes, and we also have fish, which are not shown here, fish and other animals in the lake. But as we add nitrogen and phosphorus to this system, it actually allows the algae to bloom and grow in greater quantity. 
the nitrogen and phosphorus are actually limiting factors, meaning when we run out of them, we can no longer uh, grow. So by supplementing the phosphorus and nitrogen, we actually initiate an algal bloom, uh, so more algae growth. Now, <clears throat> that seems like it would be a good thing, uh, but as the algae grow, uh, they're producing oxygen through photosynthesis, but they're also consuming oxygen. And eventually, uh, because of the algal growth, we're going to block some of the light, and the water's going to get murkier. And as it gets murky, murky some of the plants are going to die. And the algae are going to go through their cycle and die also. And as the plant die and the algae die, they fall to the bottom, where they get decomposed by bacteria. This process of decomposition, decaying by bacteria, the bacteria are um, aerobic bacteria, and so they're consuming oxygen. As these bacteria consume oxygen, the oxygen levels in the lake uh, drop, and then fish have a hard time. The fish basically suffocate, and so then the fish start to die, and the fish die and fall to the bottom, and they're decomposed by bacteria, which is consuming even more oxygen, and this uh, process can accelerate, and uh, the lake becomes not very um, inhabitable for uh, animals that need uh, large amounts of oxygen, or plants that need large amounts of oxygen, for that matter. And slowly and surely, uh, the, the lake will fill up with debris on the bottom and become shallower and shallower, and the process accelerates, and uh, we eventually will get lake death. And where the lake used to be will just be a depression in the ground. And like I said, this is a normal process for small lakes, but oftentimes this is sped up through the impact of, of agriculture. The runoff of fertilizer that has lots of nitrogen and phosphorus in it and phosphate in it comes off of the agriculture, um, the farms, and into the lakes, uh, into the streams, and causes this, uh, it raises the carrying capacity for algae, and we get this algal bloom, which sets off this process of eutrophication or eventual lake death. We'll talk about this process more in class. Uh, bring your questions, and we'll, we'll go through it again in a little bit more detail. Just wanted to introduce it now. We also have a concept called lake turnover. Now, lake turnover is different. Uh, this happens in places where we have very um, pretty large changes in temperatures throughout the year. So if we look at a lake, uh, let's start here in the summer, where the temperature is warm. Um, the, and this is in Celsius, by the way, these temperatures. Um, and the water at the top will be warmer than the water at the bottom. And as we go deeper, the water cools off. Now, if you recall, what temperature is water its most dense? Most liquids, as they turn to solids, become more and more dense, uh, and they would be the most dense at, at when they become a solid. But water, we know, is unique, and it's at its most dense at negative 4 degrees Celsius. So at the bottom, we have this heavy water, this dense water, uh, sitting at the bottom. Uh, and we have this definite uh, thermocline, this uh, region uh, here uh, of a distinct temperature change as we, uh, almost a barrier between the warmer water at the top and the colder water at the bottom. But as we move into the fall and the air temperatures start to drop, the water at the surface begins to cool, and it drops from this you know, 20 and 22 degrees, and it eventually gets to be cold. And when it hits, any water that hits negative 4 degrees will be more dense than any other water, and it starts to drop, so it starts to fall. And as it falls, it pushes the water from the bottom up towards the top. And what that does is it stirs the lake up. The nutrients that are at the bottom uh, get stirred upwards, and the more oxygen-rich water at the top uh, gets moved to the bottom. So if you look at this graph over here to the, the right, you can see the distribution of oxygen, dissolved oxygen in the lake as we go deeper. And we can see that we have a deep, this, we have less oxygen the deeper we go. And towards the top uh, zero meters, we have the most dissolved oxygen. But once we stir this lake up, once we flip it over, uh, during the autumn as we get this turnover, we stir up the nutrients and we stir up the oxygen and spread it more homogeneously throughout the lake. Then we move into the winter and uh, we get colder and colder and actually slightly colder water sits on top because negative four is more dense than negative two and eventually the top might freeze and we get this uh, temperature stratification in this direction. And again, we see a change in the relative concentration of oxygen at different depths. We see the stratification of temperature and oxygen. And then as we warm up in the spring, and this water that's zero warms up to two, and then from two to three, and from three to four, we go back to our drop, and that drops pushes the water up. And so we turn the lake over twice during the year. I don't want to talk too much more about the marine biomes except to point out that estuaries are a very important part of the basis of the food chain 
uh, and the coral reefs also and the, from the health of the ocean standpoint those two areas need to be protected from an environmental standpoint from um, uh, industrial processes and overdevelopment. I want to finish this introduction with a concept called ecological succession and the first type of succession we're going to talk about is primary succession. We have primary succession and secondary succession. And so primary succession, primary means first, and to succession means a, a, a moving through certain stages. I'm sorry that these are so small. Hold on a second, let me make this. There we go. Primary succession, the process through which a virgin environment is inhabited. A new environment. Organisms will move in and establish themselves in a new environment where no life has existed before like a cooled lava flow, or a land exposed by a withdrawing glacier, or a new beachhead. This um, is a very uh, predictable set of, of stages, uh, where each stage prepares the environment for the next stage. So, for example, think about Hawaii, how Hawaii came to have such a lush forest. Hawaii was formed from volcanic activity uh, pushing new landmass up out of the ocean. And as this lava cools, it's just bare rock. There's nothing there. But eventually, you know, we get to where we see, uh, you know, this lush forest and highly, you know, these tropical forests. The question is, how did they get from this uh, over here to this and this? Well, it did it through a process called primary succession. And as you have this bare rock, the first type of organisms that will move in and uh, occupy this and inhabit this uh, area, whoops, did not mean to do that, uh, are lichens. You may recall that lichens are a unique organism that is actually a mutualistic relationship between green algae and a fungus. They can grow on bare rock where uh, the, the fungus component is able to pull minerals and water and uh, moisture and minerals out of the rock and the uh, algal component makes photosynthetic, photosynthetically derived food. And after a while it breaks down the rock and creates little pockets of soil and then mosses and then ferns can move into there and the mosses and ferns uh, create uh, even more pockets of soil and eventually if you look through the whole process of succession we start with the exposed rock we have a pioneer community that gets there first, the lichens and the mosses, which create small pockets of soils, which then can sustain shrubs and uh, little seedlings. Uh, also, insects will move in at that time. And then we, we move through a forest to a finally a climax community so that we can go from this exposed rock over you know, very long periods of time, of course, to a uh, climax community of a mature forest. So if that's primary succession, what's secondary succession? Well, secondary succession is a series of stages in the repopulation of an environment that had already been established but was destroyed. So it's starting with pre-existing existing soil. For example, uh, if a forest fire wipes out an area, we can see that the secondary succession would take many uh, fewer years than a primary succession, uh, and we have a much more uh, different pattern of repopulation. We don't start with lichens and moss. We start with very opportunistic small shrubs and seed plants and grasses that then repopulate and prepare the the environment for the, the next level of species that it can sustain as we go from our pioneer species to our intermediate to our climax community. And this can happen over a relatively short amount of time, you know, from zero to 150 years, whereas the primary succession would take many, many more years. Well, that concludes our introduction to ecology. We introduced a lot of terms. Uh, we'll elaborate on a few of these topics as we get into class, but I wanted to get us off to a good start. Uh, we will have other videos on uh, ecology, uh, focusing on concentration on uh, population ecology, where we look at how populations grow and disperse and what uh, is affecting that growth and uh, distribution. We'll talk about community ecology, where we look at interactions between species like predation and competition and how that affects and shapes uh, ecology. And then we'll look at ecosystems, uh, where we look at how energy flows through a system and how uh, nutrients cycle through systems. And finally, we'll end up with a video on the human impact on the the environment. So each one of these will probably get its own uh, video in the in the coming days. So please check back frequently.